One of the easiest ways to spark children's interest in science is to introduce them to the wonders of electricity, though with adult supervision, naturally. Always among the most popular exhibits in any science museum is the silver globe that makes your hair stand on end. It's called a Van de Graaff generator, and touching the globe transfers the electric charge that it is creating to the person touching it. If that person is insulated from the ground, for example, by standing on rubber or plastic, the charge builds up and each of the person's hair follicles repels all the others. As far back as 2750 BC, ancient Egyptians had discovered that certain fish could administer electric shocks. But the term electricity was coined by the English scientist William Gilbert, who derived it from the Greek word electron, which means amber, in the year 1600. Amber was chosen as the inspiration because even ancient cultures had figured out that rubbing amber with fur would give it special powers of attraction. It could pick up light objects like feathers. Despite these early observations of electricity, we didn't sort out how to harness it for our own purposes until the 19th century. It wasn't until Ersted, Ampere, and Faraday worked out how electricity and magnetism are related that the first electric motors were finally invented in the 1820s. Once this link was established, electrical science and engineering proceeded very rapidly, and within about 100 years, virtually every home in the Western world was equipped with electricity. But even in the first half of the 20th century, many people regarded electricity with apprehension and not simply because it could be dangerous if mishandled. As early as the late 18th century, biologists had discovered that electrical impulses drive our nervous systems. Luigi Galvani is credited with the discovery of bioelectricity in a published paper in 1791. According to some sources, Galvani was in the process of dissecting a frog on the same surface that he had used to play with static electricity when his assistant, his wife, touched the frog's sciatic nerve with a metal scalpel. Sparks flew, and the frog's leg kicked to life. If you'll pardon the pun, Galvani was shocked indeed, and he became the first person to document the relationship between electricity and not just the appearance of life, but life itself. Because this discovery predated our detailed knowledge of electricity, popular culture associated electrical phenomenon with the supernatural. People thought that electricity could bend the laws of nature and awaken the dead. Those who could harness electricity, like Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, were imbued with the status of wizards. Horror films were filled with monsters revived by electricity. To this day, electricity seems to have quasi-magical powers, just like magnetism, its closely related cousin. And yet, the world as we know it would not exist if electricity failed to flow through our bodies, our homes, and our cities. Every atom with an electron has the potential to create an electric charge. As we know, electrons have an inherent negative charge. There are two other particles in the nucleus of atoms, protons that have an inherent positive charge and neutrons that are neutral. Most atoms found in nature are electrically neutral because the number of electrons equals the number of protons in the atom and the charges cancel each other out, leaving the atom with no net charge. But electrons can be transferred from one atom to another, disrupting this fine balance. This flow of electrons is what we call electricity. When two different surfaces are rubbed together, electrons can be transferred from one to the other, as is the case when you rub amber with fur, or glass with silk, or your comb through dry hair. Electrons get transferred, but no new electrons or other particles are created. So whereas one substance becomes more negative, the other becomes more positive. The result? Static electricity. It's not just by physical contact that electrons get pushed around. 
Chemical reactions, electrical circuits, and radioactive decay are just three more ways to change the electrical charge of different objects. But within a closed system where no particles flow into or out of it, the total electric charge remains static. The law of conservation of electric charge holds that no new charges are created. Because like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract, electric forces can alter the motion of an object. For example, if you move two like charged objects toward each other, the force between them will cause one to repel the other, moving them away from each other. While electric charge can be transferred from one object to another, it can also move along or through an object. But different materials are more or less helpful in moving along the charge. Some substances are good electrical conductors, like metals, and others are poor conductors, which we call electrical insulators, like rubber, some plastics, and wood. What makes one material a, con a conductor and another an insulator? It's all about the atomic structure of the material. Because the outermost electrons in an atom are the furthest away from the nucleus, they are also the easiest to pick off. In materials that are good conductors, these valence electrons, as they're called, often pop off and hang out freely throughout the substance. Good conductors are materials that have more electrons that are easier to pick off. When a negatively charged object comes into contact with the substance, the unruly electrons get out of its way, traveling further from the point of contact. If a positively charged object is around, they will find their way over to where that object is located. Now, insulators run a tighter ship. Electrons are kept in line and there are far fewer wanderers moving about the decks. So when charged objects come into contact with an insulator, the ship's crew stays put and the flow of charge is stopped. So what happens when you rub amber with fur? Well, amber and fur are two objects that are part of the triboelectric series. Tribo from the Greek word for friction. Objects in this series can exchange electron electrons through contact and the series is often listed with respect to how easy it is to pick off electrons in that particular material. The better a material is at capturing electrons from another, the lower down on the series it is placed. The further apart two objects are in the series, the easier it is to induce static electricity by rubbing them together. So the materials with the loosest electrons are towards one end of the list, and the ones that hold their electrons most tightly are at the other end. Amber, for example, is listed lower down the series than fur. And so if you rub amber with fur, amber will pick off electrons from fur and become negatively charged. Up until now, we've mainly been talking about point charges, that is, the electric charge in an object, material, or particle at one particular point. For example, if you bring a negatively charged rod near a conductor, then the point of contact on the conductor will be more positive, and the furthest point will be more negative as the negative charge sends electrons away from it. But we can also describe electricity in terms of fields. An electric field is made by static electric charges. When these charges are in motion, the field is electromagnetic, as the motion induces a magnetic field as well, as we saw in the last lecture. When we illustrate a field, the field lines move away from positive charges and towards negative charges. For our purposes, we will talk about forces when we want to consider electricity at a particular point, and fields when we want to take into account the space around a set of charged particles. Since like charges repel and opposite charges attract, bringing two like charges together takes work. The same is true of separating opposite charges. So when two like charges are brought closer together, there is an increase in electric potential energy in that system. And the more charges are involved, the greater the potential energy. Energy is measured in joules, while charges are measured in coulombs. 
a concept that incorporates the idea that more charges mean more energy is the electric potential. Electric potential energy of an object is a combination of its own electric charge and its relative position to other charged objects. The electric potential, then, of an object or a system is its electric potential energy per unit charge, and it's measured in volts. Now, the potential difference between two points is also measured in volts and is called voltage. Positive charges flow from a region of higher electric potential to one of lower electric potential. That is, positive charges move in the direction of lower electric potential. The opposite is true for negative charges. They go from regions of lower potential towards regions of higher potential. This movement across potential differences by positive and negative charges has been exploited by evolution. Our nervous systems function by taking advantage of the potential difference between the inside and the outside of our nerve cells. So to get an understanding of how electricity and electrical potential function in nature, let's explore their role in the human body. All of the nerve cells in our bodies, whether they're located in the brain, spinal cord, or any part of the peripheral nervous system, send and receive information in the form of electrical signals, as we learned in our lectures on neuroplasticity and perception. For example, when we step on a thumbtack, the receptor cells in the skin of our foot pass along an electric charge to the nerve that runs through the foot, which in turn signal cells in the spinal column which trigger electrical cascades in the pain center in our brain. As you'll recall from our exploration of the brain, the cells in our nervous system are called neurons, and they come in different shapes and sizes. But they all have a few characteristics in common. They receive signals through branch-like structures called dendrites, send those into the cell body or soma, and then relay the signal down a single axon, a long, thin protrusion that in turn sends it along to the dendrites of other neurons, or the receptor region of a muscle cell, or other type of cell that uses the information that it receives. These electrical signals depend on the potential difference at the boundary of the cell, the cell membrane. Ions, that is, atoms or molecules with an uneven number of protons or electrons, abound in the extra and intracellular fluid. Because they have uneven numbers of protons and electrons, they hold a positive or a negative charge, depending on whether they have more protons or more electrons. Outside the cell, sodium ions holding a positive charge and chloride ions with a negative charge are plentiful, while inside the cell, positive potassium ions and negatively charged proteins fill the intracellular fluid. By the process of diffusion, molecules like to move from an area of high concentration, where there are lots of them, to an area of low concentration, where there are fewer of them, spreading the love around, as it were. So the tendency is for sodium and chloride to want to move into the cell, and potassium to move out. But remember that the cell wall is only selectively permeable. That is, only some molecules or compounds can pass through. The membrane achieves this selective permeability by containing channels that let in some molecules but keep others out, like a lock which requires a specifically shaped key to open it. Neurons have channels that let out potassium ions easily, but make it harder for sodium to pass through. Because potassium leaves and the positive charges aren't replaced immediately by sodium, the interior of the cell becomes slightly negatively charged near these channels. This negative charge attracts positive ions on the other side of the membrane, so a slightly positive charge builds up on the outside of the cell. This separation of positive and negative charges creates an electric potential difference across the membrane, which we call the resting membrane potential. This potential ranges from minus 40 millivolts to minus 90 millivolts, with an average about minus 70 millivolts. To maintain this resting potential and the sodium and potassium ion gradients, cells are equipped with sodium-potassium pumps, which require energy in the form of a molecule called ATP. We'll learn all about ATP and how energy is generated in animal cells 
in our lecture on metabolism. But for now, suffice it to say that for every three sodium ions that the pump dumps out of the cell, it pulls two potassium ions in. These pumps keep more potassium inside and more sodium outside, which results in a slightly negative charge. But it's the ion channels that are specific to sodium and potassium that are responsible for most of the negative charge. When a neuron is at rest, or not firing a signal, this membrane potential is negative on the inside with respect to the outside. Then, with the right trigger, a series of events leads to the propagation of an electrical signal, which we call an action potential. Here's what happens. Some stimulus, whether it's an action potential from an upstream neuron or a photon in the retina or the bending of a hair cell in the inner ear, causes some sodium channels in the neuron to open along the membrane and allow sodium ions to flow in freely. These ions are driven into the cell because there are fewer sodium ions in there, and there is a slight negative charge. We call this the depolarization of the cell because it's going from a polarized or negatively charged state towards a more neutral state. If the depolarization is strong enough and reaches a specific threshold, then an action pot potential is triggered. An action potential consists of an initial rise in the membrane potential. It goes from negative to neutral and overshoots the neutral point to become slightly positive, peaking at around 30 millivolts. Then it quickly returns to its negative state. We call this the falling phase. And it even undershoots the resting potential a little bit. That is, it gets slightly more negative than the typical minus 70 millivolts membrane potential. Eventually, it returns to its resting state. How does this all happen? If the depolarization reaches the set threshold, then many more sodium channels open at the same time. At first, the influx of sodium neutralizes the negative charge as those initial sodium channels open, rendering that region neutral. But they continue to flow in, and the membrane becomes slightly positive as the ions continue to even out the concentrations of sodium on both sides of the membrane. In a very short time, the membrane potential changes from about minus 70 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts. Once this new peak is reached, the sodium channels abruptly close. In the meantime, at about the time when the sodium channels are closing, potassium channels open, letting potassium ions flow out of the cell, making the inside of the cell more and more negative. When all the sodium channels are closed, some potassium channels remain open, causing the negative undershoot. When these channels close, the cell returns to its resting state and is once again maintained by the energy-consuming sodium-potassium pumps. I know this sounds like a lot of information for a little action, but understanding the action potential and the consequences of its shape helps us understand conditions like epilepsy, memory formation, attention, and virtually every other task that our nervous system engages in. You'll remember from our lectures on perception and neuroplasticity that these electrical signals are the key to how our brains work. Understanding them more deeply helps us understand our brains. But it also illustrates the principles of electricity, whereby the potential difference across the membrane induces the flow of charged particles in one direction or the other. Our knowledge of the intricacies of the action potential has helped scientists develop treatments for the myriad diseases of the brain and nervous system. But that progress has also depended on scientists' realization that brain cells don't act alone. Rather, they operate as part of large circuits. And most applications of electricity in modern technology involve circuits as well. So let's consider how electric circuits work. An electric circuit is nothing more than a closed loop system in which electrons can flow to generate electricity. In every circuit, there is some power source, like a battery or a generator, that produces the pressure or force necessary to move the electrons. We again measure the force in terms of volts, or electric potential energy per unit charge. The electric current is measured in amperes, the amount of electric charge passing a point per unit time. 
To calculate the total power in the circuit, we multiply the current by the force and get the wattage. So a 1.5 volt flashlight whose current is 1 amp has a power of 1.5 watts. If you think about an electric circuit as analogous to your own cardiovascular system, then the heart functions as the battery and the rate of blood flow is the electric current. Now the force with which the blood flows is the voltage. But not all of your arteries and veins are clear of obstacles. Sometimes the buildup of plaque or other compounds impedes your blood flow. The physical structure of the wire or artery can increase or decrease the resistance to flow. In an electrical circuit, we measure the resistance in terms of ohms, which is the voltage divided by the current. You'll probably understand intuitively that the larger the diameter of the artery or wire through which the blood or current flows, the less resistance there is. In the brain, the wider the diameter of the axons and our neurons, the faster the action potential travels down to the synapse. Now, a circuit can be designed such that the current flows from one area to the next in a serial fashion, like a string of Christmas lights. If one bulb burns out, all the bulbs remain dark because the current can't flow. We call this a series circuit for obvious reasons. But another way to design a circuit is in parallel, like the wiring in your house. If one light bulb goes out, you can still use electricity in other parts of the house, even though they are all powered by the same source. This is because each appliance or bulb or section of the house can almost be thought of as a separate circuit, all of them working in parallel. Current flows into and out of each device or section of the house separately. We can be thankful that our brains didn't develop as a series circuit, but instead as a very complicated set of parallel circuits. Even if we happen to blow one mental bulb, the rest of the lights will stay on. Now, even though the same voltage is applied to each of the parallel circuits in your house, the current flow is controlled by the diameter and fabrication of the wiring and other components attached to each bulb or appliance. So what happens when you blow a fuse? Well, hopefully, your house is equipped with circuit breakers rather than fuses. Both components function to stop current flow when there is a danger of overloading or short-circuiting an appliance or an outlet. Both of these conditions result in a situation in which the wiring or the appliance can be damaged by too much current flowing in at once. Fuses are sacrificial lambs. They work once to stop the current flow and then need to be replaced. But circuit breakers are electrical switches that turn the flow off when there's a danger of overloading. When they shut off the power, it's usually because we tried to use too many appliances at once, overloading an outlet. But once we turn off the offending appliances, we just push the circuit breaker back to the open position so that the current can flow once again. And the equivalent of circuit breakers in our brains are those inhibitory neurons that can stop the firing of overly excited neurons before they cause any damage to the brain. In patients with epilepsy, these circuit breakers fail to function properly and unchecked electrical activity can spread throughout the brain, causing a seizure. We can put in artificial circuit breakers in the form of pharmacological treatments that work for many patients to prevent seizure activity from spreading in the brain. But in rare cases when the drug treatments don't work, neurosurgeons can locate the source of the seizure and remove that part of the brain permanently. The way that current flows through our brains, our homes, and our appliances illustrates one more major advance in electricity that has shaped our modern world. Batteries, fuel cells, and other standalone sources of electricity create a current that always flows in the same direction between the negative and positive terminals of the energy source. We call this type of current direct. Historically, electrical circuits were all designed such that electricity flows in one direction at all times. But Nikola Tesla, whom we met in the previous lectures, came up with a novel way of incorporating magnetic forces into electrical circuits to create alternating current flow, flow that reverses direction periodically. What's the use of this reversal? Well, over long distances, 
DC or direct current loses power and there's no way of stepping up the voltage to get it to its destination. But an alternating current or an AC current, which is produced by power plants and comes out of the electrical sockets in your home, it changes the direction about 50 to 60 times per second and can be stepped up to high voltage levels or stepped down to lower ones. How does this work? Well, let's say that a power plant wants to send 1 million watts of power into a city. Now, they could choose to send 1 million amps at 1 volt, but that would require a huge wire. Because remember, amperes are the amount of electric charge passing a point per unit time. Alternatively, they could send 1 amp at a million volts with only a thin wire, but then the socket in your house would be extremely dangerous because it would have enormous potential energy. So instead, they use alternating current, which allows them to change the transmission of electricity along the way. They can start out by sending high voltages that are dropped down the closer they get to the city, so that by the time the current reaches your home, it's a much safer 120 volts rather than 1 million volts. Our homes use alternating currents since our electricity has to travel long distance from the power plant to our home. Amazing to think that from what we noticed in a chunk of amber and a piece of fur, we figured out how to power a metropolis. In this lecture, we've again covered a lot of ground from electric charges to action potentials and the wiring in your home. I hope that as we hop from one subject to another in this course, you're able to appreciate the wonderful ways in which scientific discoveries in one area fuel advances in others, and how each area of inquiry seems fundamentally connected with every other. For example, the development of parallel circuits, which at one time was simply a technological innovation, has helped us understand how our brains function and enable us to navigate the world. In fact, it is likely that the parallel nature of the brain circuit is ultimately what will provide a solution to the binding problem that we talked about in lectures 7 and 8. The mystery of how a modular brain produces the illusion of a coherent experience of consciousness. Further proof that every piece of scientific knowledge, no matter how seemingly small or specialized, has the potential to utterly change our understanding of the world and our relationship with it. We've now seen how important electricity is as a form of energy in our bodies and in the world at large. Another form of energy that plays a key role inside us and all around us is heat. What science has learned about heat and how it behaves has made possible many aspects of modern life as we know it. In our next lecture, we'll explore thermodynamics, the study of heat's relationship to work and to energy in other forms.